Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to the Niche Cache Variety Show. We are from the Niche Cache, the niche-cache.com, and that's just where you can find all sorts of Aotearoa sporting yarn and kōrero. Big up the Patreon whānau for supporting the Niche Cache directly. We've just recorded our Patreon podcast which will be there in the Patreon feed for all members of the Patreon Fano. We discussed the football fans. We discussed a bit of domestic football within Aotearoa as well. We didn't really break down or solve the Stephen Adams mystery, but we definitely talked about the Stephen Adams injury mystery, and we also talked a bit of Kiwi cricket. And the Patreon podcast finished with Sean Solia hitting a six down the ground. In the New Zealand A versus Australia A game, as we start recording the variety show, New Zealand A require 350 runs, five and over on the final day of their series. And straight after Sean Solia hit that six, he middled a full toss to old Schweppes in the leggy and he got out. So that was cool. That's how our Patreon podcast finished and this is how the variety show starts but big up the patreon fano we're doing an extra podcast there every week and it is the best way to support the niche cache directly you can support the podcast you can support the website and you can support support our email newsletter as well patreon.com forward slash our niche cache and speaking of the email newsletter we sent that out uh, via tornado on monday evening Whenever I think about that, I'm thinking about that Frank Ocean song because I could probably do a remix like A tornado flew through my road the other day Excuse right. the mess it made Kind of rains in southern Auckland Blah, blah, blah That's a good jam So shout out to anyone affected by a tornado Ruckus times in Aotearoa But we're out here living And what was I talking about? The email newsletter We send those out, those out via Substack thenewscase.substack.com every Monday and Friday evening. To be honest, if we're, if we're being completely a hundo, full steak and cheese here, a lot of the stuff in the variety show we explore via our keyboards in the email newsletter. So the email newsletter on a, on a Monday, we're breaking down all the Kiwi sports. Then we come back on a Friday evening and we set up and we discuss and we yarn about the uh, stuff that's happened during the week but it's a good thing to have on a monday for us because we work through all our kiwi sports ideas then we come here into the podcast pocket on a tuesday and a thursday and we chat about it so it's kind of mandatory reading like if the website is mandatory re reading the niche-case.com Email newsletter via Substack, that is also mandatory reading, especially on a Monday, probably on a Friday as well. Like, I don't want to diminish the Friday dispatch, but the Monday is the big one coming off the weekend sport. That is the nichecache.substack.com. And we need a bit of mindfulness. What do you got? Well, I didn't go with this in the end i got a i got an ancient proverb to go with but i was tempted to lean on i don't know if you watched the um the alex rufa documentary thing that the a-league did with their all access thing and they finally picked a phoenix player on the 20th week of the season but um bit of a like insight into alex rufa on that and it was the first 10 minutes is just your standard sort of insider doco stuff where it's just the guy saying the expected things you expect like you know i i had to work hard to come back from these injuries and i did and now i'm back from the injuries kind of thing my my dad and my uncle were both good footballers kind of like it's not it, it's nothing new it's an interesting little insight to hear it from him but then the second half of it you they've got like the match day experience thing so you get a little bit of like cameras on the sideline and a few highlights from the game uh when they lost to melbourne victory in their last home game so you get a bunch of good Ufuk Talai stuff. And one of the things Ufuk Talai says at the start, like his pre-game warm-up, he does this surprise, he says this surprisingly like, I don't know, almost like Zen mindfulness quote where he's like, remember boys, before you go out there, you, you come into this world with nothing and you leave this world with nothing. All we have are the moments along the way. Here's your opportunity to go out there and grab a moment, do something memorable for yourselves, for the fans, whatever. And I'm like, this is... 
I don't know, this is a layer of, of, of Tele that you don't normally get. The whole thing was actually really more interesting to hearing Tele screaming on the sidelines and given these kind of instructions that he gives, telling his team to be more patient and all this. But in particular, that little uh, pregame warm-up, I thought you caught me by surprise with that. But I do actually have a proper mindfulness, um, which is an ancient proverb that to, goes... Just to interrupt you, like... Unless you want to add to Tele. Mindfulness isn't really helping them win games of footy, you know. Like, it's yeah, I know a... he needs to go a bit deeper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is they're not breaking it down; they're just chucking it out there. Um, three losses in a row. We'll talk about that when we come around to the takes. But proper mindfulness: no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. You see why that one trumps the yeah, yeah. um unfortunate. Uh, unsuccessful in inspiration attempts. Praise Jar that you came out with an absolute like, just one that cut through all the clutter there. That's a good one. I like it. Kiwi Sports. It's cracking. We're going to flow on the back of the Phoenix. The Wellington Phoenix are losing games. The mindfulness isn't helping them win games, but I do think it might help them. Uh, endure adversity to come out the other side with a positive mindset to step in the river as different blokes and a different river with a different tide there's no tides and rivers though you know it probably doesn't work but well, sort of river flow i guess yeah flow yeah yeah flow um we're more like estuary type of geezers you know like estuaries yeah. and mangroves we're the rivers really that the, run off the rivers yeah we're not really in the uh in the river we're in the estuary but your leading headline segment, what do you got? We know what you got. Drop it. Yeah. Bad loss from the Knicks away to Melbourne City last night on an Easter Monday. Um, just a just a bad loss against a good team, admittedly, but it was made worse by the fact that they just, I don't know, they were definitely beaten by a stronger side, but there were also moments, like pivotal moments within there that they didn't claim, um, unfortunately for Ruffy. Moments that they kind of let slip. There was the, like, the penalty shout just before half time, I thought was a much better shout than the um than the referee of VAR seemed to give credit for. But they, but even before that, there were several good chances along the way where they just someone makes the wrong pass or the the finish isn't good enough or things like that. And then of course the the main one was old Costa Barbarossa's running through on goal. They're three one down. He could make it three two and set up a, a a grandstand finish. Instead, he kicks it straight at the keeper. They clear the ball out to the sideline. Josh Laws kicks a guy in the face and gets sent off. So within the space of like 15 seconds, they've gone from potentially getting back to 3-2, instead being 3-1 down and down to 10 men. Um, and it didn't get that much better from there. It looks like the home semifinals thing is probably going to be a bridge too far after three consecutive losses. Um, this team just hasn't found that extended run of form that they have in the last few seasons where they would go like eight or nine games unbeaten with a bunch of wins in there and really set up their whole season. They haven't done that this time around. Why is that? I mean, the obvious thing to say is that they've continually blown leads and conceded soft goals. They're underperforming on the old XG markers. Um, not by heaps because Oscar Zavada's ability to score a goal per most games from across is definitely helping them there, but Below that, you look at like Bozidar Krajev is slightly above his XG, but he, he scored a bunch of goals at the start and hasn't really done much recently. And then your next three guys uh, are um, uh, Costa Barbarusas, David Ball, and Jan Sars, who are all multiple goals below where they should be on the expected goals uh, things. So some bad finishes in this team, certainly not helping them. And then soft goals that they've managed to concede amongst a bunch of defensive changes, but it really doesn't feel like they have the defensive steel that they have had in, in past years. And it's something they haven't quite figured out yet. Haven't had the imports firing at the same time is another issue. I think you had Cryer very good at the start while Zavada and Sass was slow. Zavada then came around, but Sass took quite a while. Sass is playing quite well at the moment. Zavada is playing excellently. But Kryev isn't playing very well, and Wooden's been out injured for a lot of the season, and David Ball's had probably his worst season as a Phoenix player so far. Like They just haven't got the reliable consistency from their best players, from their import players. They've lost some of that tactical flexibility, I think, as well, when they with the loss of Piscopo and especially Soterio. They don't quite have the same ability to to adapt to different teams in different ways that they've had in the past. Even Ben Wayne, I think, is a guy who who not having him and being a guy who he can just be out there and find the knack to score a goal, even if he's not that involved. 
we haven't got that at the moment with the Phoenix. They're really over reliant on Oscar Zavada that way. And if you kind of shut him down, they don't have that many other answers. And then, as I say, too many soft goals conceded. Wooden's had a lot of injuries. They've got inexperienced fullbacks between, you know, um, Kellen Elliott, Sam Sutton, Lucas Moragas, all really good players, but not necessarily the, you know, inexperience is going to cause you mistakes now. And then Ollie Sale's also been inconsistent, which hasn't helped. However, they're still in the top six. There are three games to go. They're at Eden Park on the weekend against Brisbane, and they normally do well at Eden Park. They've never lost there. Um, probably not going to get a home semi-final. That idea is looking unlikely, but a final spot, a top six spot, entirely within their control. We know how good this team can be on their day. Even if there haven't been enough of those days lately, they still might find one in an elimination final game when it comes around. So therefore, there's still a lot to play for. And one way or another, they should at least still get up the opportunity to do something which they have not done since 2012. And this is reminding me a bit of the Football fern stuff. Um, football fans have never won a game at a World Cup. As much as we want them to get out of the group stage in the, in the World Cup, you also got to like walk before you can run. Let's, it's, let's just keep in context that they've never won a game at a World Cup and they're trying to do that first and foremost before they can do the other thing. We'd like to see the Wellington Phoenix go on a nice finals run and really cap off the Ufuk Tele era if indeed this is the end of it. But they've also not won a finals game at all since 2012. So at this point, I'm willing to pivot my expectations to be like, well, let's just make the finals and then we'll see if we can't break that dec decade-long finals win streak, um, with list streak rather. That's my new expectation for the Wellington Phoenix. That's where we're at with the last three games of the season, plus hopefully one more on top of that. Plus, hopefully two more on top of that. Plus, hopefully three more, but we'll see. One step at a time. The big man, Israel Adesanya, had a victory in the UFC. Rematch against Alex, Alex Pereira. He's now three, uh, one and three against Pereira in his career, but one and one in the UFC. And this was two, a couple of things. Three things stand out for me. First is the precision of Israel Adesanya. We've seen it throughout his career. He picks his spots with absolute precision. The blow, like he did land a bit of a meaty right hook to, uh, to Pereira first. But then the shot that dropped him was right behind the ear. And it was just pure Adesanya where he just picks his spot, lands it, presses the button, see you later. And also, and these are things you can draw inspiration from. You know, we are for the children. We are for the kids. So whether it's you, your big Donny yourself, or the or the kids, get some inspiration from Israel Adesanya because precision often beats power. You don't need to be the biggest bloke, the biggest wahine. You can just have precision. You can have skill. As long as that is world class and elite, you're going to be competing at a high level and also the mental fortitude, the self-belief. Like Israel Adesanya just maintained an immense level of self-belief and just probably mindfulness here, being aware of some doubt, but shutting it out and just knowing that he could get the job done with his mental fortitude, precision, and skill. And the other thing I was thinking about with Israel Asanya is he's done it every way. Okay, CKB, Israel Asanya, they are the world-class strikers, so let's put them up against wrestlers handles that okay you need to go into a like a a five round war against kelvin gastelum what do you got what do you got deep in that tank of in the darkness in the depths what do you got he won that fight okay you're going to come up against these beefing dudes costa vittori they're bigger they're stronger they got grappling they got power what happened there they lost Come up against Whitaker, the all-round skills here. He's got the wrestling. He's got the striking. He's even got a bit of Kiwi mana. What do you do there? You defeat him twice. And this Pereira one, Israel Desanya was finished while he was up against the cage. What happened against Pereira in this fight? He finished Pereira while he was up against the cage. So any way that Israel, you want to put Israel Adesanya in a fight, any situation, he can win. He can find a way to win. And of course, this all comes with some of the best fighting coaches in the world. 
city kickboxing, best in MMA, best in boxing as well, probably in New Zealand. We'll say world class combat within sports. New Zealand, yeah. When you consider like Parker's say combat sports, been outsourced combat sports, and, yeah, combat sports. Don't shoot me down. Yeah, that's fair. Combat sports, best in the world. So amazing result for Israel Adesanya. Let's get statistical. So are you going to drop like so, ten stats or just the one? Uh, three or four, probably. You might need to get a wiggle. <laughs> what, what I was going to do is I was going to just run through some bullet point things of Wellington Phoenix women's ideas from my season recap roundup thing last week. But what ended up happening was that they were mostly just Michaela Foster stats. So I thought, well, I guess this is just the Michaela Foster moment then. So, um, Michaela Foster stats. She led the team. The Wellington Phoenix women, she led the team in minutes as a scholarship player. She wasn't even on a full contract and she played more minutes than anyone else in the entire thing. She only missed out on, on playing every single minute of all because of the third to last game when she was on a yellow card and she got subbed off to avoid risking a red card. So she missed out by 26 minutes on being ever present, which is actually something that Liz Anton of Perth was able to achieve. One of the seven players across the league to do that while Katie Bowen only missed the ever-present status by one minute in the one game that she was subbed off. So Foster is, may have led the Phoenix in minutes, but she was only the third most Kiwi minutes this season in the A-League. Um, three assists overall. Obviously, you know, realistically, she may have got three assists, but there were several more corners of hers that led indirectly to goals. Nobody in the entire A-League, nobody put in more crosses than uh, Fozzie. She, 143 of them. There were only two other players in the AL dub to even get to triple figures on crosses. She had 143. Interestingly, uh, the Phoenix had 73 total corner kicks. 69 of those were in swingers. Four went straight on. Zero out swingers. Not a single out swinging corner kick across the entire season. That is what happens when Michaela Foster takes all but four corners and she's genuinely two-footed. So she takes in-swinging left-footers from the right side and in-swinging right-footers from the left side. There you go. Um, shout out to the four players who each took one of those other spare four, four corner kicks uh, somewhere along the way, especially to Charlotte Lancaster, whose only corner kick that she took, an in-swinging left-footer, by the way, set up a goal. So <laughs> got an assist from the only corner that she took. Um Foster was top 10 in re defensive recoveries, top 10 in inter interceptions. The defensive Mahi definitely all good as well, but it's, this, it's the crossing and set pieces that are her X factor. And the only drama there with the Wellington Phoenix is that it's not actually a whole lot to aim for when it comes to the Knicks. I don't know if you've seen their front line, um, like pick their attacking players out when they're all lining up for anthems or whatever, or handshakes. They're, they're not the biggest. Um, they're not the biggest in terms of height or in terms of strength. So, Naturally, they're all kind of bang average uh, in terms of the aerial duels and getting on the end of those crosses. Satchel, um, Robertson, Clegg, Pritchard, all of them were, had less than 30% success on the aerial duels across the season. Emma Ralston was a little bit better, but only played a third of the season because of her injuries and suspension. And then for whatever reason, she just didn't get that many crosses coming her way. It's only really when the defenders came up for corner kicks that we saw the good stuff with Foster's um, set pieces. Hence why Marissa Vandermeer was able to score three goals. Kate Taylor as well gives a little bit of it, but it's it's not a whole lot to aim for on the end of the crosses. Um, however, football ferns, you do have some bigger, stronger options. And guess what? Foster's first start for the ferns against Iceland recently sets up a goal for Hannah Wilkinson, an in-swinging corner headed in at the back post by a tall striker. There you go. That's how it's done. That's the Michaela Foster effect. Um, what you got for your own stats? I was going to do about 10 cricket stats, but we're trimming it down on the fly here, and I've just got one stat. One stat to ponder, especially over the next couple of weeks as the Black Caps are in Pakistan. I'm not going to go any further than that. Just keep this in your mind during this Pakistan tour. Kane Williamson has a list A batting average of 46.62. Will Young has a list A batting average of 42.23. So Will Young is kind of almost near abouts as good as Kane Williamson. Let's just say that. Deep in the mangroves, NBL basketball, 
loving it on the telly it's always there fantastic to see the um i love the stadiums i love the local stadiums you get to see the um like some invercargill stuff you get to go like uh hawks bay or you know uh, canterbury and just see pretty decent crowds across the whole nbl and some different arenas and different atmospheres environments which One of the reminds best me of the, the mangroves are always quite sports as well isn't it like just the fact that it's on so many nights and you just tune in catch a quarter of basketball or whatever if you can catch the fourth quarter of a game they're normally exciting it's a it's a very fun time of the sports when it happens to be on like dur during that season where it's just like oh yeah hawks are playing the rams tonight or whatever sweet as i'm just i didn't realize it was on but i'm just gonna sit in and watch the whole thing because it's that good so that's in the mangroves spinning out <laughs> that is let's go a little bit deeper in the mangroves though because i want to pick out five players who i i'm not saying they're the five best players or the five mvp candidates or anything like that i'm just you know five players who i'm really they might end up being mvp candidates that'd be pretty fun if they were because i think i've picked five quite exciting players but five guys who i'm just quite a, you know curious to see how they go five players who i think are very poised for a for an interest in nz nbl season first one is ty winyard who was moved to the canterbury rams Winyard, I mean, he's had a couple of really good sort of resurgent breakthrough years recently. I think playing with, uh, he's definitely playing with Taranaki at least one of those years. Um, also playing 3x3 basketball for New Zealand as well. He's been really good there. Like he's been the standout 3x3 dude for the for the tallbacks there. Um, and you see, like he's looking fit. He's defending as well as he ever has. He's, I don't know, you just get shades of reminding why when he first went to college, he was the best Kiwi prospect since Stephen Adams at that point. And that didn't work out for him. But he's been a, he's been real good recently. And I love that move to Canterbury. I just feel like that's a that's a fit where he gets to be like a dominant dude on a strong team. Um, Taylor Britt with the old uh, pick and roll game, I think is going to be real good. So Ty Winyard's definitely up there. Hiram Harris, number two. Hawks Bay Hawks, who just have one of the most, like, they kind of just assembled the most, like, the five most fun Kiwi players and <laughs> chuck them all out there at once. Like, that's that's a that's a real funky team to watch. And they're 2-0. They won their first two games on the first weekend. Their imports haven't even arrived yet, so they're going to get better. But Hiram Harris is, like, he's the glue and he's the heartbeat for that team. He's so exciting to watch. He does a bit of everything. And he's a free agent in the Aussie NBL. Two years with Adelaide. Second year, not quite as good in terms of the raw numbers as minutes dropped a bit. But if you look a little deeper than that, uh, you'd notice like some of the advanced stuff actually suggests he was playing better just in a just a matter of he wasn't getting as many opportunities as he had been. He's been released by Adelaide. He's a free agent. He's up for grabs. Every other team in the NBL should look at, should be looking at a dude like that. But in particular, I've said it several times. I'd love to see him on the break as I think he'd be great for them. Next up is Cruz Perro Hunt. He's playing for the Auckland Tuatara. I don't believe he played in the first game, um, but he's been one of the standout dudes in college ball over the last few years. He could have gone back for um, a fifth year because people who had a COVID year are allowed to an extra year of eligibility, but he's opted out of that. He doesn't want to do the extra year. He's just going to graduate and go professional. His first stint on that is playing for the Tuatara. He was top scorer for a Div 1 team last year, so... Uh, I mean, that's automatically high pedigree for coming into a league like this. Love to see what he gets up to. And then the last one is a double banger from the Franklin Bulls. You've got Tyrell Harrison, who is actually the longest surfing player on the Brisbane Bullets at this point, but was injury affected through a lot of last year. Didn't really get to do that much. Big man. He has the potential to just be like gobbling up rebounds throughout this league. Like he's got the size and the strength. He's got the, um, he's got, you know, experience at a higher level. And, Along with him, they've also got Dan Fotu at the Franklin Bulls, who, again, missed most of the last season coming out of college, signing for the Breakers, missed most of it with injury. I just want to see Dan Fotu carrying on the legacy of one of the great uh, Kiwi basketball and families of recent eras and doing what he does well. He didn't really get that many opportunities even after he came back from injury for the Breakers, so here's an opportunity for him to just cut loose here in the NZ stuff and... Yeah, Tywin, Tywin Yard, Hiram Harris, Cruz Perro Hunt, Tyrell Harrison, and Dan Fotu. They're the five fellas that I've picked out. What you got in your own mangroves? 
we got a Warriors loss against the Newcastle Knights. It is important to note the Warriors SG Ball had a victory over Manly Seagulls. I think that was their final game of their season. They didn't make the finals, but they did finish mid-season. And of course, as part of a trend I'll touch on in a second, we do have like uh, Leka Halasima moving up from SG Ball to New South Wales Cup. I think you've got Jacob Laban who is also SG Ball eligible. He played for New South Wales Cup on the weekend. So you might see some of those younger lads pushed into New South Wales Cup later on. But for now, you've got Halasima as the main joker there. And Halasima and Laban, they played in a big win over the Knights in New South Wales Cup. They put 50 on them in Newcastle. Get that in, yeah. It was pretty good. Dallin Watane Zelezniak scored four tries and... He looked fast, he looked powerful, which was good to see. I don't know if we're going to do Warriors Deep in the Mangroves like every variety show, but I do. I am enjoying this at the start of the season, especially these losses. Because after the loss to the Roosters, it was an impressive loss. And this wasn't an impressive loss, but it was also an interesting loss because the Warriors... I think it just shows that the Warriors rolling out their grit and grind style of football that I have talked about in previous podcasts, that is a lot different when you're doing it with 17 top tier NRL players compared to doing it with without some of those players. Most notably, Tohu Harris, the two games he has missed, the opponents have scored 30 points on the Warriors. That didn't happen in the four games with Tohu Harris. And of course, we're also talking about passing. Everything from those first few games, it was passing, it was defense. Funnily enough, Tohu Harris is the best at that. So you take him out, there's obviously going to be a dip in the Warriors' performance. But also, no Mitchell Barnett, no Marata Niakore. They are extremely physical players. They want to win the physical collision every time. They're going to run harder. They're going to tackle harder. They're going to smash you. They weren't playing. And so that grit and grind style looks a lot different if you don't have those lads in your team. And of course, you lose Wade Egan during the game. You lose Tamari Martin during the game. So there's a lot of adversity there. However, the Warriors were still in the contest. Yes, to your point, every single week, there was a slow start, but the, and that may have decided the game. But the Warriors were in the contest right up to the end, regardless of who was on the field, regardless of the fact that Bailey Surinam was playing dummy half or, you know, they were without Timare Martin. The Warriors stayed in that contest, so throughout every single game this, this season so far, we've seen a high level of grit and grind, but also just the effort the intensity, the desire to play out the whole game, which, again, these things haven't always been associated with Warriors football. But I'm seeing a certain level of effort throughout every single game. And another low-key point from this game was the... So there's like a collective theme of the Warriors... Um, rolling out intensity and effort and, and grit and grind and all that stuff through every single game. But there's also an individual thing where players against the Knights in the second game against the Knights this season were put in different positions. So you had uh, Tom Alley played the most minutes of his games this season. He made the most tackles. He had the his basically his best game of the season. So you think about Tom Alley this season, he's getting 10 minutes off the bench, 20 minutes off the bench. Suddenly, away trip to the Knights, he's playing 46 minutes off the bench. Suddenly, Tane Tuaupiki is on the bench. So he's getting experience and repetitions as a bench utility, as a live wire off the bench. That's going to be useful later on in the season. Uh, you've got Sifakula was named 18th man. So suddenly, Demetrius, Demetrius Sifakula is getting more experience around the NRL team. Bailey Surinan, he plugged a hole at dummy half. Haven't really seen him do that before. Again, that's going to be useful later on in the season. This might have been Adam Pompey's best game. 
So he's, you know, the team lost, but Adam Pompey was shining. Let alone just the consistent performances from Sean's Nickel Crook star. Adam Fanua Blake was pretty impressive. There was a lot to like from the Warriors as far as opportunities and development and consistent performances that is going to serve the Warriors well throughout the season, I believe. It didn't help them win this game because to win games in the NRL, especially against the pretty solid Knights team, having your best players helps. However, opportunities from this game are going to flow into how the Warriors perform later on in the season because at some point, Tom Alley is going to play, need to play big minutes in a must-win game. What happens when the Warriors need points and Tain to our pickies on the bench for whatever reason? Does he know how to fit into the system coming off the bench? All these little details that the Warriors showed against the Knights, again, didn't help them win the game, but I think there's a lot to take forward from this loss against the Knights. And what do you know? Warriors are still first, first in completion rate. It's still there. That's still a thing. So I think the foundations are still alive and well for the Warriors. We're not getting dramatic here. Just on to the next one, and we'll see what happens next week. Who knows? They might have a buy next week. I don't even know. Haven't even got that far ahead. Question time. You've talked about the Phoenix. You've also talked about the football ferns. My initial question featured the word optimism, but I'm going to change it to who are you more hopeful about? The Wellington Phoenix or the football ferns? Obviously, in the context of Wellington Phoenix in their A League season and football ferns in their World Cup journey, who are you more hopeful about? Well, under the optimistic term, I had it sort of like a little bit of a toss up. I'm not sure which way to go. And I decided I'd probably go with the football ferns. Um, the reframing into hopeful, I think pushes it even more though in case of the, in, in the case of the football ferns, because I don't know, it, it feels like the Phoenix blokes, uh, the, the both teams have been sort of spluttering a little bit, but it feels like the Phoenix blokes are more up against a brick wall where it's like a, the, there are problems that they haven't quite been able to solve throughout the course of the season. With the football firms, it just feels like the pathways to getting to where they want to go to are a little bit simpler because it's we we saw a lot of it against um, against Iceland in the first game of this current tour. It's like you just get Vikessen back and automatically everything's a lot better. And Rebecca Stott makes things a lot better. The next time they play, they've played Nigeria overnight after, after we record this, but um, after that, the next time they play, Rhea Percival should be back. And if Rhea Percival's back, things will get better on top of that. CJ Bott isn't playing at the moment. She'll make things a lot better as well. Like there's there's a case where if they can get everyone fit for the World Cup and, you know, they've, they've never won a World Cup game before, as I said before. That's the first quest. And they are going to be playing a game against the Philippines, which is definitely one which they can do. And if they win against the Philippines and don't manage to get out of their group, I'm still going to be kind of happy with that. If the Wellington Phoenix like get to the finals, or first of all, if they stumble out of the finals entirely, that's going to be a disaster. If they get to the finals and then lose, that's going to feel disappointing. If they get to the finals and win, I don't know. It's Even if that happens, that only kind of matches what the football firms are doing. And then the football firms also have this, like, um, just the the framework of the world cup itself i think elevates everything so if it's if it's evenly matched the ferns win anyway because it's going to mean so much more follow up question do the football ferns need wayne smith on their coaching staff <laughs> um who's no, the equivalent like ricky herbert or something <laughs> no, my no, question it's be is wayne smith because he it's new zealand and he's a rugby coach and we need wayne smith sure of course well i mean Michaela Foster might be able to ask your dad to get in contact. Yeah, so but he, might be he's able to not set a winner. That one up. He's not a winner. He's not Wayne Smith. No, but he but he knows the, uh, he knows Wayne Smith's phone number. I'm sure. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> um, 
yeah, my question. There's a New Zealand yeah, chop, A chop. tour going on cricket, New Zealand A against Australia A, just nice and simple. Like what are, what have you learned so far from these games? Well, as someone who has been complaining about the age of the Black Caps all summer, too many 30 year olds. Like it's an elderly Black Caps team who went seven and two this summer. Like they're far too old. There's too many old blokes in the Black Caps. I am fascinated by the youngsters in this New Zealand A team. Far more youngsters in the second team than the first team. Mitch Hay is playing. We've got Dean Foxcroft is playing. I think both of them played the first game. Ashok and Willow Rourke are also playing. You've also got Muhammad Abbas, young Wellington cricketer. I think he's originally from Auckland. He's a Wellington all-rounder. Fantastic start to his Plunkett Shield batting career. And he wasn't in the initial squad but he's right there in the middle order. And the way he hits sixes, he might come out and win this game for the Aotearoa A team. So as someone who's been complaining about the elderly Black Caps all summer, it's the young flavor in this New Zealand A team. Let's get into musical jam to round us off here. I want to highlight a project from the god Fahim. Do love a bit of his raps. He's got a new project called Dump God Reloaded and a similar taste of music. If you do love a bit of the sample heavy, kind of loopy hip hop, check out Nicholas Craven. He's got a bunch of collaborations as well and he's got a new track that I was listening to before. So check out The God Fahim and Nicholas Craven, but also shout out to Reiki Ruawai. I think he's from the same Raglan circle as uh, Meroki. And he's got that surfy, kind of wavy, kiwi jam that we do love. Your musical jam. Yeah, new albums by American groups Wednesday and Boy Genius are on the, um, are on the to be listened to list on the back of, well, on the back of lead singles, but also on the back of just previous work from both of them. Boy Genius is a bit of a, like... Um, super group with uh, phoebe bridges and um a couple others so that's that's definitely on um looking forward to getting further into those ones and then also an album to highlight from the um uh the most recent album jukebox that we did so the roundup of albums that came out last month or there or thereabouts is a record by a dude called matt joe gal who's uh born in dunedin but has like been based in the melbourne music scene for the seemingly like about a decade or something and he's got an album out which seems to be like i don't know i saw it on Bandcamp advertised as one of the one one of those lists like the best new country releases and it doesn't really sound like a country album but it's a um because you've got a full-on backing band and whatever it's probably in that frame of what they would call americana music which is sort of like part country part rock part blues but i don't want to call it americana for a kiwi dude from dunedin who lives in melbourne like that just sounds wrong so i don't know what the version of that is but that album like it's very good but in particular the first three tracks on it are outstanding and the rest of it doesn't quite live up to the to the start but it's you know it's top loaded and it's good enough to to play through um but yeah i don't know i don't know what the kiwiana australiana version of that because it's still using the american themes um genres but that one's good that was that's a that's a good one i'd recommend that that is the Niche Cage Variety Show. We'll be back on Thursday with a big old Niche Cast episode. Big up yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Cheer. Cheer.